Hi, let's talk about gay marriage. It's a good topic to discuss because it tells you whether or not you understand the legal system in the United States. And a long time ago, I was against gay marriage. I wasn't really against it. I wasn't really, you know, I just wasn't for it. And certainly my opinion had nothing to do with any sort of antipathy uh, towards any population. My concern was that most people, gay or straight, when they get married, have no idea what they're actually doing. What they're doing is they're standing up for a set of complex laws that they don't understand and that will be enforced at some point in the future by a, a judge they don't know and who may be corrupt. And if I gave you a book of laws and I told you these laws are going to determine the way that all the property that you've worked for will be divided and the book is about 250 pages long and can only be understood by a professional and can only be enforced properly with about $100,000 in cash. A lot of money. And I said, this is what marriage actually is. Nobody, you just don't use the word marriage. Nobody would sign up for it. In fact, they'd probably call you nuts. And yet, that's what happens every day. And that's the power of marketing. And it hasn't changed. And it used to be that the topic of gay marriage had offered an opportunity for people who understood the legal system to be able to create a partnership track that would give everyone gay or non-gay, the same rights that in the past could only be given by a religious entity. And that movement essentially fizzled out. It's surprising that the topic of gay marriage is still not talked about often because there is no national law that allows gay people to get married. And that means if you're in a state where you don't have a partnership track, you have to go to a lawyer and spend a lot of money creating a contract that allows for the disposition of assets and all the things we just talked about, but in a more straightforward, understandable way. And most likely you still have to go to court in case there's a dispute in order to enforce that contract. And so a lot of people will say, well, wait a second, if that's, you're still making it complex. And if you still have to go to court and still have to get a lawyer, how is there an advantage? Well, the advantage is that you have to sit down before you get married and make sure that you're on the same page. And if you're able to consult with a lawyer before, you know, it's very similar to the process of a prenuptial agreement. And you also have postnuptials as well, but it allows everyone, regardless of sexual orientation, to sit down and try to figure out how they want to live their lives in the future if something goes amiss. And even today, that because of that, that discussion is no longer at the forefront, we're not very, we're not any closer to a, I guess you could, you could call it a two track system that allows less influence by religious entities. And if you remember in the past, only religious entities were able to do things like dispose of assets, allow for marriage, and so on and so forth. Governments were either not centralized or were not in the business of handling these sorts of social issues. And so one of the reasons that religion still enjoys a preferred status within most societies is because the government has failed. The lawyers have failed to create an alternative that's viable. And as a result, we have, we still have a lot of problems because you have this old status quo that enjoys a tax exemption, 
and that can enjoy a lot of influence simply because it's got a quasi-monopoly on a very important social matter, which is relationships and the disposition of property and assets during that and after that relationship. And of course, you can see how that dynamic allows religious entities to also have influence over the court system, over the laws. And if you have influence over one area of the law, in most cases, it's not, you're not gonna stop at that one section, they're gonna keep going. And that influence will extend into other parts of civil law and into criminal justice and so on and so forth. What you've really done by not allowing a two-tier system is you've, you've, allow, you've allowed religious entities to form a beachhead allowing them to dictate many issues within our lives. And so what we, and, and there was a movement in the past to simplify legal forms. People came up with the forms. And then of course they realized that you can't really, you know, without the, the consulta a consultation of a lawyer, do a copy and paste situation especially not 20 years ago when computer programming was fairly basic. And so people started to realize that having an expert is worth something and that these simplistic forms are not workable. But that uh, because that movement for a viable alternative has stalled, was really still back, as far as I'm concerned, in a situation that resembles wherever we, we were 500 years ago. And that's particularly true in the case of international systems, where it's still fairly complex to create a situation where you're married to somebody overseas or outside of your country and you're trying to get both countries to accept both of you in both countries don't really have a system for that, at least not a universal one. And that, of course, affects the efficacy of globalization. So remember, our globalized society has allowed the free movement of things, because those things can be sold, but not the free movement of people. And in the past, when you had the free movement, well, I wouldn't call it a free movement, but we'll call it the movement of people across the ocean, it was for them to be sold. So when we put all these issues in context, what you're really looking at is simply a failure of not only the legal system, but international organizations that have prioritized the movement of things and not people. And marriage of any sort is a good gateway to understanding all these different issues even though it may not seem to implicate larger issues of trade, and yet it does, once you look at it in context. So what's probably going to happen is a situation where the status quo continues until the lawyers can figure out how to replace the role of religious institutions within civil society. And this is not a movement based on any sort of antipathy towards religion. It's a movement that recognizes that when you allow any entity a monopoly, you're probably going to have corruption. And that's exactly what happened with the Catholic Church and indulgences and all sorts of other issues that allowed a monopoly and then that allowed the church to charge excessive amounts for the functioning of a civil society. And that money, of course, then allowed it to create influence within the enforcement mechanism of those marriage laws. And then from there, expand to other areas of government because once you allow the enforcement of one sort of contract, you're admitting 
that these entities are able to enforce other kinds or potentially able to enforce other kinds of contracts as well. And then you've got the procedure that has to be established. And you can just imagine any sort of corrupt entity, you know, coming up with ways of, of making money on what should be a fairly straightforward process. You know, they can start charging for special kinds of paper with a, an, an imprimatur or a stamp that only they can sell in order to make sure it's legitimate. Um, you know, the whole point of government was to have a public, it's public, right? Everyone should be able to participate. And the private sector would balance out the government's tendency to be monopolistic and also corrupt. And that's why we tend to think intuitively that you want a society with a balanced private sector and a balanced public sector. And yet, within this institution, there is no balance. And so when you talk about how to fix it, what you're talking about really are not forms. What you're really talking about is a disposition of assets that should be understandable in the simplest way possible, but not by on an individual basis. In other words, you want to have a legal law that allows people to say, well, you've got this really complex system. And if you want to sign up for that system, sure, you can. But why not create another system that allows people with minimal amounts of funding or assets to enjoy almost all the privileges of this other more complex system. And then you can easily imagine, again, what would be called a partnership structure where anybody, regardless of sexual orientation, signs up for a more understandable, more straightforward asset disposition protocol that both of them understand and one that can be modified over time. And you can see how unequal, you can see how the law sort of on an a priori basis favors complexity because what happens if people, two people get married and one has, one has unequal assets? One person has nothing but her youth and the other person has nothing but his money. I'm sure they have more, but that's, a simple example to explain a simple point. What do you do in that case? Well, that's why you have a community. You want to sit down and try to figure out what works for everyone and try to advise people in a way that makes sense. That's why you have the public sector so they can have, especially now when you can reach anybody with the click of a button online or on your phone and have a system that allows anyone 18 or up to click on a web page that says here is in simple terms what you're signing up for and these are all your options and if you're concerned about say uh visit visitation rights for children then in that case all right if you can't work it out then you, you may have to go into the court system and try to figure out a way to resolve the issues but it's not as if, again, that's a randomized assignment. It's not as if, you know, there's a guarantee that system is going to be better than one that you and I can come up with on our own. But of course, you want to have a template. And you can see how this goes back into the problems of copy and paste. But what you really want to do, have the government do, is create the laws, a partnership track, and then try to figure out what works and what doesn't work and then modify it over time. In other words, have institutional knowledge that can be transferred and improved upon generation after generation. And what people want today, what voters want today is, un is unreasonable. What they want is a perfect system right off the gates, right off the bat. And so the government, when it's confronted with criticism, caves. It says, well, you've got this, these outliers that have caused severe harm and have damaged our credibility. And so we're going to exit the business altogether of marriage and in doing so, allow the old guard the ability to enforce the status quo, which also allows them influence.
over other areas of the legal system. And so what we really need is a government with a backbone. And we don't really have that now because we don't have politicians with credibility. And that, that's affected everything, our entire lives. And so when you, people ask, or when people denigrate political systems, or they ask why political systems are important, the easy answer is that to the extent that they lack credibility, in, in, in other words, if you live in a country where the politicians lack credibility, you're essentially ceding your life and the disposition of everything you've worked for to chance and really to the status quo that came before you over which you had no control. There has to be a better way. And so when you talk about, we started off talking about gay marriage, we moved into globalization, moved into the movement of things and people, and now we're into government. It's all connected. And hopefully now you can see that, that the marriage, the business of marriage and romance is really a political issue. And it's one that hasn't really been improved upon for quite some time.